Welcome and thanks for joining us for tonight's webinars, my IBD learning webinar series. Our topic tonight is IBD treatment and how to achieve steroid free remission. Tonight we're going to be covering a few things. We're going to explain what it means to be in remission, provide an overview of current IBD treatments, discuss when steroids are appropriate, detail how to wean steroids and condition to other treatments, and talk about the importance of treatment chart and treatment remission. My name is Melissa Strauss. I'm the Associate Director of Adult Education and Resources at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and I'm pleased to be facilitating tonight's program. The My Ability Learning Webinar Series features different educational topics throughout the year, and actually, tonight is our last program of 2022, but please stay tuned. We're going to have some more programs for you in 2023. You can um, learn more about My Ability Learning at our website, Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. Um, slash my ID learning. So just a few housekeeping notes uh, before we begin. This program will be recorded and accessible to view after tonight's program. So if you're registered, you will get an email and a message with the recording. If you have questions for our presenters during the program, we encourage you to enter them in the Q&A box. And we will try to get to as many as we can. And if we don't get to one tonight, you can always reach out to our help center for additional assistance. If you're interested in live closed captioning, there are two ways you can access it. You can click on the little CC button on the bottom bar and click on show subtitles. And if you don't see that option, you may need to download the latest version of Zoom. So I want to thank our event sponsors, uh, Fairing Pharmaceuticals and Data, for supporting our Monday Learning Learner series. Their support enables the foundation to continue to provide important education for patients and communities. So now I just wanted to take the opportunity um, to introduce our experts for, the, for this evening. We're, welcome, we're happy to welcome Dr. Um, Jose Aguilari. He's an adult gastroenterologist. He's an assistant professor of gastroenterology and hepatology at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Madison, Texas. And we also have a host of the Moscow Forum, who specializes in pediatric gastroenterology. He serves as an associate professor of pediatrics at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Both Dr. Aguirre and Dr. Sam are members of the Foundation's National Scientific Advisory Committee, and we're so happy to have them here this evening. So we're going to go ahead and kick this off with Dr. Aguirre, who's going to present on steroid use and important to this presentation. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I'm happy to be here tonight and talk with everybody about steroid use and inflammatory bowel disease and their role in achieving remission. Next slide. I have no disclosures for today. So today I'd like to start off by reviewing a little bit of our, of our agenda. First, it's important for us to define remission. Uh, it's very important for the entire healthcare team, uh, caregivers and patients to understand what does remission mean and, how, uh, and what are our markers of remission. Uh, we'll then uh, segue into a review of some of the common IBD treatments and their roles uh, in the induction and maintenance of remission. We'll also discuss the appropriate use of steroids because they are an important uh, armament within IBD treatments. And very importantly, stress the transition from steroids to our definitive therapies. Next slide. I'd like to first start by discussing the global goals of management. This is something that the entire healthcare team needs to understand and, and be on the same page with. What we're trying to achieve is a normal health-related quality of life. Uh, we also want to prevent morbidity. This is, uh, you know, of course, we want to keep patients out of the hospital and, and away from surgery, uh, if at all possible. Provide psychosocial support, given how um, difficult to can be and lifelong um, and the lifelong nature of, of this disease, as well as cancer prevention. Importantly, though, I, I am going to focus on uh, achieving both a sustained and durable period of steroid-free remission um, in our treatment plans. Next slide. 
So what does remission mean for us? Well, over, over time, I think that these definitions have changed and different providers or healthcare team members may have different definitions um, that we've seen. Initially, we used to seek for symptomatic remission. What this meant was that we had an improvement in patient reported outcomes. So basically, as a patient, how are you feeling? Have your symptoms improved? And that was typically where we took our therapies. Over time, the more and more we've learned with our, with our therapies and emerging goals, uh, we've also learned the importance of having endoscopic healing. And what this basically means is that when we do the endoscopies, that the mucosa is now much better healed and not so, easy, not so easily breaking down in regards to bleeding and ulcerations. Next slide. So what does this mean? So right now, our, our preferred goal of management is what's called deep remission. And this is when we have both a combination of symptomatic remission, so symptoms are improved, as well as endoscopic healing. And that's, of course, a goal that we're trying to reach. So the combination of the two is our preferred goal of management. Deep remission is important because it is associated with sustained remission. So basically, we'll have longer periods of remission as well as reduced uh, surgical risks. Histology, um, oh, if you could please go back. Histologic remission at this point in time is not needed. So when we take the biopsies, we still will see, you know, many times see evidence that there is disease, but we haven't proven that this is actually needed or it hasn't shown to, to change our outcome. So right now, the endoscopic healing is what we're looking for. And this is important because control at this degree of inflammation may reduce our cancer risks. Next slide. So to summarize, this schematic um, offers just a, a pictorial representation of what deep remission is. It's when we've achieved uh, clinical symptom control, we have improvement in our biochemical markers and have defined a mucosal healing. Oh, and all, and that all three of those coalesce into what we call deep remission. Next slide. This is a classic treatment peer, uh, pyramid on how we uh, how in the past we've approached treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Starting on the left, we look at mild going up to moderate and severe disease on the left. And the bottom of the pyramid is for the treatment of mild diseases. Here we use medications like antibiotics, the aminosalicylates, and some locally delivered steroids. And more moderate disease, we would then step up to use of systemic steroids, medications like the immunomodulators, and in severe disease, eventually this can include treatments such as surgery, cyclosporin, or advanced therapies. And advanced therapies consist of our biologics and our small molecule inhibitors. Next slide. As we've continued to evolve um, and improve our, our treatment uh, modalities, we are now starting to see a top-down approach when we have moderate to severe diseases. Here on the left, we see an early disease. We start to use the advanced therapies first. This is, again, these are medications like the biologics, small molecule inhibitors, the immune modulators, and steroids, and then reserving surgery for later in disease. Next slide. So how do we approach um, all of our IBD treatments with so many, so many different uh, medications now available? Well, first off, our therapeutic decisions are categorized into the induction. So that's basically improving patient symptoms, getting patients out of flares, and then maintain maintenance of that remission to prevent future flares. On the, on, the, um, on the left side, our medications to induce remission include medications like the corticosteroids, which we'll be discussing in detail later, immunosilicylates, immune modifying drugs, biologics, as well as the small molecules, the, the, uh, the advanced therapies. Now, typically a medication that we start off with to induce remission is one that will continue to maintain that same remission. The major exception here is the corticosteroids. So I've highlighted those on the left in red. Corticosteroids can be used to induce remission, but they are not used for maintenance. And again, our goal at the end is to obtain and maintain steroid-free remission. Um, and so that's why we don't see those as part of the, the maintenance arm of therapy. Next slide. The aminosalicylates, uh, these are anti-inflammatory drugs. These are the most common drug used to treat inflammatory bowel disease. These medications act locally at the mucosa in the intestine and colon to help limit inflammation. These medications are offered in either oral or topical formulations, depending on how extensive diseases are. 
uh, and medications that can be delivered by NMR suppository are typically used when we have limited disease to the left side of the colon. Immunosalicylates are uh, rather safe medications. They are used in both the induction as well as remission in mild to moderate cases of ulcerative colitis. Uh, but their efficacy in Crohn's disease still remains debatable and not as commonly used there. Next slide. The next step up in therapy are the immunomodulators. These include medications like azathioprine and mercaptopurine. These are some of the oldest medications that we have in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Azathioprine is simply a prodrug for, for the 6MP. Uh, immunomodulators in Crohn's disease are used for induction as well as, as, well as remission, and these are classically used to, to spare us from the use of steroids. Uh, and ulcerative colitis, more of our data and experience has shown that these are better for maintenance of remission in ulcerative colitis. Importantly, though, the immunomodulators do take some time to work, anywhere from up to three to six months where we start to see their, their final effects. Uh, and so oftentimes these medications are combined with steroids in the, in the uh, early time point, again, because the steroids work fast. And then we taper those down to um, as we anticipate that the uh, immunomodulators will start to take their more long-term effects. Next slide, please. Next, we'll discuss the advanced therapies. This includes traditionally our biologics, but as well as our small molecules, which I'll, uh, which I'll address shortly. Uh, these, these biologics, they aim to control or modify various inflammatory targets or the actual immune cells. We have the anti-TNF medications. These are medications like um, infliximab or adalibumab. Antintegrin is a, is a trafficking molecule that is targeted by this biologic. An ex example is vedalizumab, as well as uh, anti-L12 and 23 medications like ustekinumab or our typical biological therapies here. Next slide. We've, uh, there's also been the development of small molecule oral inhibitors. So similarly to the biologics, these also do aim to control and modify various inflammatory targets or immune cells. Uh, some of the small molecule oral inhibitors that we use are the JAK inhibitors. These are medications like upacitinib and tofacitinib and sphingosine phosphate receptors like ozanamide. Next slide. Antibiotics are also used in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease, but more so in special scenarios or whenever we have complications. Some of the common uh, antibiotics that are used are medications like ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and vancomycin. We use these antibiotics for patients with perianal, uh, perianal disease, whether it be abscesses or fistulas, uh, or even other abscesses in other locations within the abdomen. Uh, antibiotics are commonly used following surgeries. If we have complications after a surgery in a patient who has a remaining pouch, pouchitis or inflammation, the pouch can be treated with antibiotics. And C. diff infections, so inflammatory bowel disease is a risk factor for the development of C. diff infections, one thing that we commonly look for um, and can be treated with antibiotics. Next slide. I've saved uh, the focus of today's topic to the corticosteroids for last. The corticosteroids, uh, these are very potent medications, and these, are, these aim to decrease the activity of the immune system and thereby limiting inflammation. Uh, corticosteroids are given uh, either by topical, oral, or IV administration, depending on location and severity or strength that is needed at the time. Commonly, medications like budesonide can be given topically or orally. Uh, topical, again, is better for more distal colonic disease, and in general, budesonide is tolerated a bit better than prednisone since it, it does have more delivery to the colon as opposed to the general system like prednisone or the IV steroid methylprednisolone. The really big important point that I'm going to continue to stress for the remaining of the presentation um, is that corticosteroids can be used for induction, but they are not to be used for remission. They are, used fat, they, they are a very fast acting and strong medication, but are not intended for long-term use. Next slide. So many times we have, we have discussions with our patients about our treatment plans and which medications. Um, corticosteroids are very, very commonly prescribed in inflammatory bowel disease, but these medications do have the highest risk profile of all of our IBD treatments. This includes the biological, they are advanced therapies. Um, so this is why it's so important for us to have a very good defined plan on the use of steroids and their transition. 
Again, corticosteroids are used for induction, again, to help us get out of a flare, to calm symptoms down uh, or signs down. Uh, again, used for induction of remission, but are not for the long term. Next slide. The potential side effects of corticosteroids are dose and time dependent. Again, this is where it's important to make sure we have a good treatment plan on how much, how much steroid is needed, how long that steroid will be needed, and then what our transition therapy will be. In the short term, we can have issues with insomnia, emotional changes or concentration issues, difficulty controlling blood sugars, uh, weight gain or fluid retention, high blood pressure, and infections. In the long term, steroids can predispose us to bone disease, osteoporosis, or even osteonecrosis. Uh, eye disorders, including cataracts, we can see growth restriction in children. And of course, the longer we're on steroids, the higher risk for, for infections in the long term. Next slide. So with these things, why do, we, why do we use steroids in inflammatory bowel disease? There are very appropriate uses, and we can use, and we should be using these medications to help us control disease and eventually obtain remission. Um, but these medications are potent. They're effective for the treatment of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease when there's ileal and colonic involvement. Uh, these uh, steroids are not typically used for penetrating, so this is basically fistulizing disease or perianal disease. Steroids are used for induction of remission, but again, not for maintenance. Uh, in more mild to moderate disease or at the local level, we can use budesonide. Again, that's more of an intestinal delivery of, of the steroid. And more moderate to severe disease, uh, we use systemic steroids. This includes medications like prednisone or the IV formulation methylprednisolone. Next slide. Steroids are used as a transition to maintenance therapy. Again, they are used for induction, but not remission. They work fast, but are not for long-term use. So when defining our treatment plan or discussing our treatment plan with our healthcare providers, it's very important that we have a plan on how we're going to use the steroids. The type of steroids will be based on the severity that, or the strength that is needed and the location of the disease. Uh, we also need to have a good idea on how long we anticipate using treatment. And typically we use a several week course with a tapering down of steroids. But most importantly, when we decide to start steroids, we always need to have a choice of a maintenance therapy that we will transition to. Next slide. So in summation, remission is defined as the combination of having both symptom control as well as mucosal healing. And that's our new emerging goal in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Steroids are one of the many medications used for the induction of remission in, an I, in IBD, but these medications are not used for maintenance of remission. Importantly, we must have a plan uh, when, we, when using steroids to transition from the steroids to our other therapies for the maintenance of the remission. Next slide. Thank you all very, very much for your attention. Uh, and I think we'll move on to uh, Dr. Gurum next. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm really excited to be here today. And I truly appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, present this important topic, which is uh, treat to target. Uh, next slide. I have nothing to disclose for this talk. So this is the agenda of my talk. Uh, so first we'll talk about what is treat to target and, uh, and you know, be before going to why uh, and what should be the target in managing IBD, uh, we'll talk about natural history of inflammatory bowel disease, what happens as the disease progresses. And then we'll talk about what should be the target of managing IBD and what are the benefits of uh, target to treat approach and how to really uh, measure the target. Next slide, please. So treat to target is a strategy that uh, has been out there for several decades in several other specialties, including endocrinology for diabetes, uh, nephrology and uh, with the internist for management of high blood pressure uh, and in rheumatology literature for over a decade now. Uh, this was first introduced into the IBD literature, uh, more became mainstream around 2015 uh, when uh, AGA came up with stride one guidelines. 
What this entails is uh, establishing a specific target, such as mucosal remission, and switching medications, adjusting dose, and trying different combination of drugs until the target, which is the mucosal remission, as uh, Dr. Aguirre pointed out, uh, is met. Next slide, please. So why uh, uh, we should have a uh, target is, you know, one thing to remember is it's always a good idea to have a, a goal uh, which will help us to reassess our strategies in achieving that goal. And, you know, one of the important things I often think about this, uh, uh, the, benef uh, the important benefit is it minimizes continuing ineffective therapy if target not achieved. This is something that's not uncommonly seen both uh, from the medical uh, practitioners as well as from the patient side, a hesitancy in discontinuing a ineffective medication uh, because of the notion that the number of available therapies uh, for managing IBD are limited. Uh, likewise, you know, if something is not working, it's uh, also you will you will potentially have side effects as a result of that medicine without getting the benefits of uh, getting your IBD under control. It also ensures the understanding between patient and physician on the need for close monitoring so that, you know, you can establish and continue to have frequent office visits, blood work and stool testing and potentially repeating imaging and endoscopic assessment at a, a set periodic intervals. And it uh, provides adequate respect for patient autonomy, but within the confines of a scheduled and structured follow-up appointment so that you know, there, there can be a discussion uh, uh, regarding the treatment plan uh, moving forward. And uh, it has been shown uh, in several different specialities that having uh, this approach improves doctor-patient relationship. Next slide, please. You know, moving on to, you know, why uh, should we worry about treating these conditions? I think it's, you know, most of the audience here will know uh, is this particular study, which was uh, published in 2018, is a review of over 15,000 uh, patients with ulcerative colitis. When they looked at different aspects of their disease, things that actually showed up are over 50% of the patients will uh, end up needing hospitalization at multiple time points during their course. Likewise, the 10-year colectomy rate is about 10%, with 20-year being about 20%. Uh, that means one in a five uh, ulcerative colitis patients will end up needing uh, to undergo surgery. And uh, likewise, there is going to be steroid uh, exposure on a repeated basis in about 50% of these uh, patients with ulcerative colitis. And then the one which we often dread about is the colorectal cancer or the colon cancer risk uh, in patients with ulcerative colitis that is uh, poorly controlled. Next slide, please. And likewise, in uh, uh, Crohn's disease, um, on your left, uh, the graph shows what the outcomes were. Uh, patient, you know, basically tells you proportion of the patients not having resection. Uh, means in in uh, uh, in the cohort from uh, 1986 to 1991, there were a very uh, uh, you know small proportion of patients that uh, may not have resection. Uh, this actually improved uh, in 1998 to 2003 as we understood more about the disease and the outcomes of the disease and how to manage the uh, disease better with the available medications. Uh, although I want to point out that between 1986 and 2003, uh, you know, infliximab was introduced in the 1996, so that probably improved the outcomes as it achieved the goal of mucosal healing. Um, on the right, you see the graph of uh, how when a patient with Crohn's disease is diagnosed, how a very small proportion of them will have uh, the penetrating disease. Uh, and uh, uh, stricturing disease, as opposed to majority of them, close to 70 to 80 percent, will have inflammatory phenotype. As time progresses, uh, the proportion of patients that are inflammatory decrease with increase in the proportion of patients that have stricturing and fistulizing disease. And moreover, uh, several studies have shown that the risk of small intestinal cancer increases. Uh, compared to the general population, uh, some studies showing a risk going up almost 10 times. Next slide, please. 
And uh, uh, this uh, cartoon pretty much uh, sums up, uh, you know, why we need to have a tight control. Um, is, is soon after diagnosis, if you uh, basically control the disease and prevent these flares, the, these uh, graphs that are representing all the flares, the more number of flares you have, the more progression of the disease leading to stricture formation and uh, uh, fissionalizing disease need for surgery uh, and again for the progression of the disease. Next slide, please. So pretty much at the diagnosis, if you employ the tight control and frequent monitoring of the disease, then you may prevent uh, progression of the disease and prevent need for surgery and decrease the need for hospitalizations and uh, 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 stricture risk. Next slide, please. So when you think about what should be our target, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Aguirre pointed out, there are several targets you can think about, including improvement in symptoms. Uh, clinical remission is, you know, complete resolution of the symptoms. And uh, Dr. Aguirre pointed out steroid-free remission, and then mucosal healing, which is um, appearance of uh, normal appearing mucosa on the endoscopic evaluation. Deep remission is combination of the mucosal healing as well as a symptomatic improvement. And ultimately, histologic healing, which uh, is known to change the course of the disease. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide because, you know, Dr. Aguirre pointed out about uh, uh, this slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so endoscopic remission is... Uh, what endoscopic remission is, uh, improvement of the inflammation seen during colonoscopy. So this is an example of a patient, uh, of one of my patients who actually had the appearance of uh, the bowel uh, on the top picture and upon re-evaluation on appropriate treatment, uh, complete normalization of the uh, bowel. Uh, and that's our current goal is endoscopic healing. However, there is more and more data that are showing that uh, improvement in uh, infl inflammation at microscopic level might be an emerging target uh, that we may have to uh, strive for. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, this picture shows you, you know, what when you think about clinical symptoms that's only uh, showing the tip of the iceberg uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, if a patient who has clinical symptoms may continue to have laboratory abnormalities and mucosal inflammation. Uh, likewise, the opposite is true, wherein a, a patient may harbor mucosal inflammation and laboratory abnormalities and may not necessarily have uh, clinical symptoms. So our goal is uh, really to uh, achieve uh, control of the mucosal inflammation. And likewise, you know, the studies have shown that the control of symptoms alone may not alter the natural course of the uh, inflammatory bowel disease, whether you're talking about ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Next slide. And this is, uh, this is one of the studies which looked at uh, about uh, 150 patients with uh, UC patients, about 98, and uh, Crohn's disease patients, about 46 all of them being in clinical remission, which means they didn't have any symptoms, but over two thirds of the patients, both with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, had evidence of active uh, mucosal inflammation or endoscopic evaluation, suggesting that you know, just symptom control may not really achieve uh, the goal of uh, mucosal remission. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, this slide again shows uh, how uh, uh, the, the uh, graph on the left uh, shows that uh, if we do not achieve mucosal healing, the chances of needing major abdominal surgery is more than two times of the patients uh, that have either complete mucosal healing or, com or partial mucosal healing. And uh, to your uh, uh, right, uh, the graph shows that. Uh, patients uh, who have histologic remission, that means even on the microscopy, there is no inflammation, the risk of having relapse uh, significantly decreases, means the risk of having a flare significantly decreases. Next slide, please. 
So in a sense, the resolution of endoscopic and macroscopic lesions in both uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are required ultimately to prevent uh, long-term disability, structural damage to the bowel. Next slide. So this is where the STRIDE uh, two guidelines come in, which were published in by uh, American Gastroenterology Association, wherein uh, the short-term target should be uh, getting the symptoms better and uh, achieving uh, uh, normalization of the blood work. Uh, and then the intermediate targets, which is in the months uh, to uh, uh, about a year, uh, is to decrease in calprotectin to acceptable range and uh, uh, as a pediatric uh, gastroenterologist, I certainly uh, you know, aim for normalizing growth in our pediatric patients. And long-term goals being endoscopic healing, with a, which is uh, in uh, around six months and uh, longer, is endoscopic healing, normalization of quality of life, and absence of disability. Although these are not considered formal targets, uh, but something that is emerging is to make sure that, uh, you know, we achieve transmural healing in our Crohn's disease patients and histologic healing uh, in our ulcerative colitis patients. Next slide, please. And uh, how often uh, do we have to monitor? We uh, have to, in Crohn's disease patients, uh, we have to check them every three months to assess their uh, clinical symptoms. Uh, and endoscopic evaluation around six to nine months, uh, um, uh, uh, every six to nine months if they have active phase. Uh, but once they are in remission at, at one of these endoscopic evaluation, then the frequency of monitoring is uh, uh, quite varied from patient to patient. But in general, uh, there is no set uh, uh, interval that you need to undergo endoscopy colonoscopy once, once you achieve endoscopic remission. And with regards to ulcerative colitis, in the first three months, uh, you really uh, have, in the initial period, you really have to have frequent office visits to uh, get a, uh, assess whether they have symptomatic resolution of rectal bleeding and diarrhea. And uh, endoscopic remission, uh, as defined uh, by absence of friability or uh, ulceration at the uh, colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, should be assessed every three months during uh, active phase. Next slide. So this is where comes in the shared decision making, wherein the patient and the physician sit together and decide, you know, what uh, should be our targets uh, to treat and what's the best option to achieve the target. And this is well known to increase patient satisfaction better adherence to treatment plan and greater treatment engagement. Again, talking about compliance and better uh, quality decision making overall. Next slide. So in summary, uh, you know, from what I want you all to take away from, these, uh, from this talk is that, that the IBD is a progressive disease and symptoms may not necessarily correlate with disease activity and uh, that control of symptoms alone may not prevent long-term uh, complications. And uh, uh, that's why treat to target approach has tremendous value in uh, managing IBD and uh, employing shared decision making helps in uh, 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 decision making in the treat to target approach. Next slide. I think that's the end of my talk and I really thank you all for your attention. But thank you both so much. We did get a lot of questions. Um, start with, there were a few questions on um, some steroids. So um, let's start. So there was one person asked, and this was sorted by, I wasn't sure if it was peds or adults, but when you stop taking steroids, how long um, does it take for your inflammation to return? And I guess, Dr. Aguirre, we'll start with you. Sure, sure. So, so as 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 you know, we highlighted earlier, uh, it's really important that you know the the steroid is used as, as an initial initial medication to help control inflammation and symptoms. Uh, but the transition to the next therapy is what we ultimately need to to um, to have in mind. Um, so theoretically, if if we were able to control inflammation well at the onset with steroids and put somebody on a maintenance therapy, if that maintenance therapy was doing its job and controlling symptoms and shows that the mucosa was healing, well, then at that point, we that medication would then be our maintenance drug. Um, there are some things that we can use that wouldn't be able to predict and help me tell you when the next flare would come. 
Uh, but there are several risk factors that put people in a higher risk for progression versus lower risk. And so those are those are things that be individualized between patients. But um, a few examples of those would be uh, if a patient had extensive disease. So let's take the entire colon versus a limited amount of the colon. Um, those two differences in, in severity of disease uh, may predict that one person may have more flares than another. But otherwise, I have no... Uh, Unfortunately, I wish I wish I had a crystal ball that would help us know when flares were coming so we could uh, jump in front of them. So here's a little bit of a follow up question. A patient is on um, prednisone right now um, and she's alternating between 2.5 and 5, um, but can't seem to get off it. So what do you recommend for those patients who you know, can't seem to get off uh, the very low dose? Sure. No, those, those can be challenging. Those can absolutely be challenging. So, you know, one thing, and I, I think a, a few of the other questions that were there would, would benefit from this, uh, but really making sure that our, our therapies are optimized. Um, so we do a lot of dose, a dose escalation when needed. And so a lot of times, if let's say, for instance, we're on an advanced therapy, uh, what we would like to do is we would like to test that advanced therapy make sure that the biochemical markers are improving, if endoscopically things are improving, um, well, then we can stay there. But if we need to increase our therapy or combine our therapies with something like an immunomodulator, uh, those are many ways that we are able to get patients off of those, you know, the low dose. Because again, at the low dose, we're probably pretty close to, to getting there. So sometimes it's just an optimization of dosing or combination with an immunomodulator that can probably help. Okay, thank you. Um, so Dr. Gurum, I'm gonna pass this question on to you. So um, a patient is uh, currently taking a biologic, ustekinumab, Stelara, and um, how long does that typically take uh, for a patient to feel better and for to actually start working when you start one of these biologics? Yeah, so it depends upon what we are using it for. So in a patient who has ulcerative colitis, you probably will see a, uh, you know, a clinical improvement within a few weeks, like I would say two to three weeks or so. Crohn's disease, uh, it may take a little longer than uh, two to three weeks. It may take up to four or sometimes even eight weeks uh, before uh, you see a response. Uh, there are times that, you know, we do use steroids on top of uh, Stellara, uh, to get somebody into clinical remission quickly. Uh, but again, you know, it varies from patient to patient. If somebody has mild or rather mild to moderate symptoms, we may not use anything else in addition to Stellara and just keep uh, on monotherapy. Thank you. And then this is, I guess, a little bit of a a follow-up question, not, not really, I guess it's more of a, just a treatment question in general. So Dr. Aguirre, there's a patient, you have a newly diagnosed um, mild Crohn's disease patient. Is there a typical treatment plan for someone like that? Uh, this is actually a, a, a probably one of the more challenging questions, uh, you know, for a lot of us. Uh, we always think it's a severe disease that is the hardest, but mild Crohn's disease can be very challenging. Um, you know, one medication, as I mentioned, the, mis the misalignment medications we had used for quite some time, but haven't overall shown to be uh, the most benefit in Crohn's disease. Um, so in, in cases of mild Crohn's, there's, there's a few things that you can, that you can discuss in regards to coming up with a treatment plan. Um, one can be to start off with medications that you can, in mild disease, for instance, you can use uh, budesonide to induce remission. Um, and then after that, if patient's doing very well and truly, truly has mild disease with minimal chance for progression, um, observation can sometimes be used in those, in those scenarios. Um, in these scenarios, I also like to, to try things like complementary medicine and make sure making sure that diet um, uh, supplements like, like turmeric is another one of these that, that we'll recommend is, is a complementary therapy. Um, and then the, the last option I think is, is, um, is using one of the immunomodulators. Uh, we've used those medications for quite, quite some time and those can be helpful in, in some of the mild cases. So um, really that, that, that question is really gonna take, you know, some working through uh, with, with, your, with, your, with your providing team um, and how, how comfortable everybody feels with, uh, with those monitoring treatments. 
You know, one, one other uh, option we use in pediatric population is Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Sure. As, as uh, Dr. Aguirre was pointing out, uh, that, that you know, counts, comes under the complementary alternative therapies. Uh, so we do use in that mild uh, uh, Crohn's mm -hmm. disease patients, uh, Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Sure. Thank you. Um, I know we, we both talked about mucosal healing and there was a talk about partial mucosal healing. So there was a question right. on exactly what does this mean exactly, partial mucosal healing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It, you know, when uh, I'll give an example of ulcerative colitis. So we use something called Mayo endoscopic scoring uh, for uh, evaluating ulcerative colitis patients uh, for the mucosal healing. So if let's say somebody's, uh, 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 somebody had, you know, severe ulcerations, uh, uh, spontaneous bleeding uh, upon doing the colonoscopy, but then when we follow up, uh, do a follow-up colonoscopy, all they have is just redness, but there are no open ulcerations. That's a partial mucosal healing. So going from, uh, in our terminology, going from endoscopic, Mayo endoscopic score of three to one, is considered partial mucosal healing as opposed to complete mucosal healing is going from uh, three to zero uh, is considered complete mucosal healing. You see, similarly, there is there are scores that we use uh, in uh, uh, Crohn's disease too to say somebody has improvement or uh, you know complete healing. So if there is improvement, we keep going with the therapy or tweak a little bit to uh, you know get therapeutic levels or get the levels a little higher uh, to achieve that complete mucosal healing. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about um, colonoscopies and um, how often um, a patient perhaps should have a colonoscopy to know if there is inflammation. And I guess, I don't know if there, this question was about a teen, but I guess thinking about adults, MPs, I'm not sure if there's a standard um, yeah, you know, you know, I can tell you on the pediatric side, this is one of the biggest concerns uh, parents will often bring up uh, is how often, uh, you know, we need to undergo the colonoscopy. Uh, I would say, you know, typically we uh, do follow the guidelines of at least evaluating for mucosal healing within one year of starting on effective therapy. Uh, and uh, let's say if somebody is, continues to have active disease, we may have to do that colonoscopy earlier in the course. If somebody is doing well, I'll wait until, you know, maybe eight months to nine months. Uh, but if somebody is not doing well, we may have to reevaluate their uh, scope uh, to see if we need to tweak the therapies or change, switch the therapies. Uh, because as I mentioned uh, in, in my talk, that there are patients who may uh, continue to have symptoms somewhat, even if there is partial improvement. So we really need to make that assessment before uh, making, you know, switch among therapies. And I, I can share the same from, from the adult standpoint, a very similar approach. We have general timelines on how well we are when we anticipate patients will start to improve. And then once we feel that we've had um, you know, good control with the medications looking, and that typically happens within that six months to 12 months. Again, assuming somebody went from induction to maintenance, you know, without, without any, without any speed bumps or hiccups. Uh, but if somebody's not doing well, then we typically need to re-examine with the biochemical markers, uh, and the endoscopy, and if we still have continued disease or some improvement, but not great improvement, uh, then we can look at optimizing therapies or, or dose adjusting. Um, but then I think once we get somebody under control and we've shown that the medication is at a good stable dose, it has achieved the, the deep remission that we're looking for, uh, well, then at that point, we can delay colonoscopies um, for disease assessment until, until we need them. Thank you. Um, so we have a question about a patient who's currently on a biologic um, and still has severe inflammation. So she's asking, what would you recommend? Would a patient at this point then do a course of steroids and stay on the drug? Or would you switch drugs altogether? I know it's a little bit specific, but Dr. Aguirre, I don't know if you had any recommendations. 
Sure. So I think that, that that can happen. You know, a lot of the clinical trials, they have their endpoints that they meet either early on or even up to a year is, is how long some of these medications have taken to work in some of the patients. Um, and so in, in that case, what I, the way that I would approach those is, of course, how severe is, is the is the, you know, is the initial disease? Uh, how much improvement have we seen with the with the current treatment regimen? Um, if our if our going to need to escalate therapy, of course, I think looking and making sure that we are making sure that the mucosa is revealing what the symptoms are revealing, because sometimes that those two things do not correlate well. Um, so in a scenario where I had somebody who um, might need more duration or increased therapy, uh, I'm not opposed to some short term steroids to help control disease, keep patients, you know, at least functioning out of the hospital uh, while we increase the therapy. But this is the, the, the whole point still would be to transition those patients off once I feel we're getting meaningful, uh, meaningful recovery. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions here. I'm gonna, I can't know if I'll get to everyone, but I'm doing my best. So question about um, steroid budesonide impacting reproduction and fertility. Dr. McGeary, do you know about um, steroids and fertility, and also what about biologics and fertility and reproduction? Sure. Oh, these are these are great questions and um, challenging. So one the first thing is uh, I I whenever I have a patient who's interested in becoming pregnant or someone who is already pregnant, regardless of uh, if they have mild or severe disease or if they're on mild drugs or advanced therapies, uh, I always want to co-manage those patients with one of our high risk uh, you know, OBGYN doctors. And um, there are some who particularly you know, focus on, on IBD patients. And so I always think that that's an important uh, person to have these discussions with. Um, the other thing I recommend for all women who are considering uh, becoming pregnant or are pregnant um, is really the most important thing for the safety of the patient as well as safety of the baby is that disease is controlled as best as possible before becoming pregnant and maintaining our therapies so that they stay in control during, uh, during pregnancy. Um, and so typically the conversations will be what we would want to uh, assess their disease activity. We would want to probably do a colonoscopy before they uh, become pregnant so that we can get all, so we can take care of their therapies and get them on a good, get them in remission prior to becoming pregnant. Um, once patients are pregnant, well, then that opens up, um, you know, other, uh, other challenges, um, in general to biologics. So, uh, with exception to the medications like methotrexate and cyclosporin, um, we do continue to use medications like the mesalamine drugs, the immunomodulators and the biological therapies, uh, through pregnancy. Uh, these medications are, are safe. The safest thing is to make sure that disease is controlled at this point in time. Uh, uncontrolled disease will lead to bad outcomes for mother as well as for baby. Um, but there, there are very few medications that we adjust um, during, uh, during pregnancy. Thank you. I have another question for you, Dr. Gary. It's about older adults. So um, a patient is asking about if you're over 60 and you're in deep remission, is it true that older adults in deep remission have a better chance of remaining in remission for the rest of their lives? So um, the data, the data is, 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 is a bit, is a bit mixed here. You know, again, if we, if we have more mild disease and somebody who is diagnosed later in life, you know, we anticipate that those are patients are less likely to have um, continued, continued flare, you know, or, or difficulty controlling, uh, or progression of their disease. Um, but it would be impossible to kind of determine who's going to have less flare than not. Thank you. Um, there's a question about, um, complementary therapies and supplements. And, um, I guess the question to both of you, is this something that perhaps, you recommend or you advise your patients with Crohn's disease or you see to take? So I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, so with regards to um, alternative therapies, I have used uh, a Crohn's disease exclusion diet in some of my patients. 
And in pediatric patients, there is evidence for exclusive ventral nutrition, which is basically uh, taking formula for uh, anywhere from six to eight weeks exclusively uh, to put them into remission, but that's not proven to maintain the remission. Uh, and Crohn's disease exclusion diet, which is again uh, shown to be beneficial in some of the patients uh, with uh, uh, mild Crohn's disease. And any of these two uh, kind of therapies, when I use, I always uh, use them like medicine in the sense that if you start a medicine, it doesn't work, you have to move on to something else. Likewise, diet is very similar. You start the diet therapy, you give a timeline, and then if it doesn't work, you have to move on to something else. Now, with regards to the complementary therapies, the only one I have used is uh, curcumin or the turmeric uh, mm -hmm. that is in addition to uh, five ASAs for uh, ulcerative colitis patients like the mesalamin and things like that. Uh, but I haven't used uh, you know, curcumin by itself or turmeric by itself uh, for management of IBD. Um, and I haven't used any other complementary or alternative uh, medications uh, in my practice. Thank you. Um, I guess to both of you or Dr. Aguirre, if you have no symptoms, if you have no symptoms at all, does that mean you have no inflammation and no need for treatment? Um, I, th I think Dr. Dr. Graham actually has, has a good slide on uh, from his slides, but that's one thing that we used to think. We used to think that uh, symptom control, it was a good marker for uh, activity of inflammation, but we've actually shown that that's not to be, that's not to be the case. Um, and alternatively, there are times that we have patients who have no symptoms whatsoever, and their colonoscopy is one of the worst colonoscopies, and the inflammatory markers are very, very bad. And conversely, I've also had some very bad endoscopies with very low inflammatory markers and, and vice versa. So um, that uh, there, there are studies that show that, that, that symptoms do not, correct, uh, do not correlate directly with the degree of inflammation, which is why the, the new goal is, is, is the two, is the merger of the symptom control and the mucosal inflammation. Control. So this is almost on the flip side. So let's say you're on a bi the patient asks if you're on a biologic and you're in remission, do you are you staying on that forever? At this point in time, if if I if you had to pin me to an answer at this point in time, you know we don't we don't currently have a a, um, a cure for the disease, and so I advise my patients that they will be on lifelong therapies. Uh, there is um, some interesting data that, of course, where the that, um, uh, that a lot of researchers are looking into in, in de-escalation, not necessarily uh, removal of therapy, but there might be a subset of patients who uh, may be able to start to de-escalate therapy. I think at this point in time, uh, the data hasn't made a lot of us comfortable to, to stop medications. And I think just a very sub, uh, very sub select few patients we would consider de-escalation of therapy. But for the time being, until better data comes out, then the medication that's maintaining you, we're, we're sticking with. Okay, I think this is going to be our final question, um, and this I think is a good one to end with. So we're, you talked, Dr. Graham, about treat to target, and so someone asked if your current physician is not practicing that or using that approach, what do you recommend um, for patients? Well, that's a that's actually a very challenging question to end with. So I'll tell you, like most I practicing IBD physicians, although they may not mention the term treat to target, they always will mention what the target of management is. You know, what should we aim for in managing a particular patient's inflammatory bowel disease? They may say, well, you know, our goal is to make sure that the, uh, you know, calprotectin comes back to normal or uh, making sure that your uh, endoscopy looks completely normal. So they always talk about that. They may not necessarily use the terminology treat to target. Uh, and, you know, in a particular subset of patients, they may say, you know, your risk of uh, medications may be too much. So let's focus on symptomatic improvement, although that's not the current goal, but there is a small subset of patients we may have to uh, weigh in the risks and benefits of approaching either ways. Uh, but I think uh, almost every practicing IBD physician will be talking about a target, may not be mentioning the terminology, but I think uh, you know each one of us uh, do use uh, uh, a target. 
Thank you. Well, thank you both so much. I know we couldn't get to everyone this evening. Um, I want to thank Dr. Graham, Dr. Aguirre um, for sharing your knowledge and presenting and answering our questions. For those of you um, who need more information, we encourage you to go to our website, rhodeskolitisfoundation.org. You can always contact our IBD Help Center to talk about your specific IBD-related needs. It's 188 by gut pain. Um, I want to remind everyone you'll be getting an evaluation survey um, right after tonight's program. We really appreciate your feedback, um, so we encourage you to please uh, help us complete it. Um, again, for more information on my IV learning programs, both virtual and in person, go to Crohn's Colitis Foundation.org slash my learning. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.